the national anthem. Distinguished invitees, you are all welcome to the 208th inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin. Please permit me to stand on the existing protocol already observed by the University PRO. It is my rare privilege and honor to, to introduce the Vice Chancellor's entourage, which is led by the Vice Chancellor, who is ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Professor J.O. Ehirobo. Others in the Vice Chancellor's entourage are the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor P.E. Uruwubo. We have also have the Deputy Vice Chancellor at Kenwan Campus, Professor G.E. Uriyarimu. 
we have the bossa, Dr. V.U. Imagbe, who is ably represented by Dr. B.A. Akoguma. We also have the university librarian, Dr. Luke Obasumi, who is ably represented by Mrs. Patience Kayuma. We also have provost deans and directors. We have the provost college of medical sciences, Professor E. Oviasu. We have the Dean of Students, Professor O. I. Bovo. We have the Host Dean, Faculty of Education, Professor E. O. S. Iyamu. We have the Dean, Faculty of Arts, Professor D. Eragbe, who is ably represented by Professor J. I. Usaiki. We have the Dean School of Dentistry, Professor M. A. Isede. We have the Dean, Faculty of Engineering, Professor K. Obahiagi. We have the Dean, Faculty of Life Sciences, Professor C. E. Okaka. We have the Dean, Faculty of Management Sciences, Professor P. O. Eriki, who is ably represented by Dr. A. E. Tafame. We have the Dean, School of Medicine, Professor W. E. Sado. We have the Dean, Faculty of Pharmacy, Professor N. U. Huangu. We have the Dean, Faculty of Physical Sciences, Professor A.P. Oviawe. We also have directors. We have Director Center for Gender Studies, Professor Mrs. E.U. Edosoma. We have the Director Center for Educational Technolo Technology, Professor A.U. Sunde who is ably represented by Ms. Oumesi. We have the Director Distant Learning Program, Professor F.E.O. Omoruhi. We have the Director Student Guidance and Counseling, Professor Mrs. G.I. Usaidu. And last but not the least, we have Acting Director, Institute of Child Health, Dr. D. Wanyeri. It is now my pleasure to call on the Vice Chancellor to introduce the lecturer of the day, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Addressed by the Vice Chancellor Professor Faraday F. Osase of Nancy FNSC on the occasion of the 2008 inaugural lecture of the University of Benin. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me to stand on the already established protocol. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2,208 uh, in the inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin. Today's lecture is the 61st to be delivered in my tenure as the Vice Chancellor of the University. And the 24th in the Faculty of Education. As a way of providing routine update on events about the university, I'm pleased to report that the second semester examinations are all going in various faculties, schools, and institutes. I want to use this medium to further solicit the cooperation of all stakeholders 
in ensuring that the current academic session is concluded successfully without hitches. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce our lecturer for today. He is Professor Lawrence Asian at my young. The title of his lecture is Creating Makers of Reality in Nigerian Higher Education Students Through Paradigm Transition Learning. Professor Lawrence Asian Epayan was born on the 2nd of September 1949 into the family of late Asian and Arit Asian Epayan of Epene Royal family from Ibibe village in Uruan local government area of Akwa Ibom State, Nigeria. He started his primary education at St. Paul Primary School Ibibe Uruan in 1953. But his schooling was cut short due to the demise of his parents. He subsequently completed his primary and secondary education in 1962 and 1966, respectively. At the end of the Civil War in 1970, he gained admission into the Government Teachers College, Uyo, and was appointed grade two pivota teacher on successful completion of the course. After several teaching stints in several schools, Professor Akbayan was admitted to the Polytechnic Calabar, where he obtained the NTTC certificate in business education and was posted to Adiaha Urban Secondary Commercial School, Uyo, as senior business studies teacher in 1977. He obtained a partial sponsorship from the Akwa Ibom State Government in 1979 for the advanced studies in further education, business education, at the University of Leeds, where he bagged the advanced diploma in further education, business education, in 1981. He proceeded on further studies to the University of Manchester, where he earned his MA degree in industrial business education in 1983. At the completion of his mandatory NYSE program in 1984, he worked at the Aqua Ibom State School Board, secondary school level, serving as a vice principal and principal in 1984 and 1985, respectively. Professor Edbeyer was appointed lecturer to business education at the University of Rio in December 1986 and transferred his services to the University of Benin as lecturer to in 1991. He earned his PhD in Education Administration, Human Resources and Organizational Management degree in 1998 from the University of Benin. He rose through the academic ranks to the position of professor in education in 2003. His areas of specialization are business education and organizational development. Professor Edna Young has held several administrative positions and served in various committees within and outside the University of Benin, such as Assistant Dean, Faculty of Education, 1993-1995, Member, Postgraduate Thesis Defense Committee, 1999-2000, Head of Department of Vocational and Technical Education, 2000-2003, Senate Representative, University of Benin Staff School Management Board, 2000 to 2003. Chairman, Interfaculty Stroke Departmental Transfer Committee, 2010 to date. Member, University Research Projects Committee, 2010 to date. Senate Representative, Academic Pro uh, Program Planning Committee, 2011 to date. Chairman, Assessment of Lecturers by Students Committee, 2011 to date. Professor Alpha Young has served as an assessor, external examiner, facilitator, moderator, and resource person to several organizations and a member of several accreditation panels at undergraduate and postgraduate levels in many universities within and outside Nigeria. He has successfully supervised more than 60 postgraduate students for certification in the field of educational management and administration. Moreover, he has 71 publications in local, 
national and international peer review journals and books, and attended many conferences, workshops, and seminars locally and internationally to gain knowledge and present papers. Professor Edna Young is a member of many professional and learned societies, among which are Nigeria Vocational Association, Association for Promoting Quality Education in Nigeria, Edo State Chapter, Association of Business Educators of Nigeria, Nigerian Association of Educational Administration and Planning, and National Business and Technical Education Board. Professor Edna Young has also served as Vice Chairman, Governing Council, Lighthouse Polytechnic from 2005 to date. He is married with four children and two grandchildren. I can see all of them smiling. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to invite Professor Lawrence Asian Epeyon, the Professor of Business Education and Organizational Development, to deliver his inaugural lecture. The Vice Chancellor, sir, the Director, the Deputy Vice Chancellors, the Registrar, and other principal officers, members of the Governing Council of the University of Benin, Provost of the College of Medical Sciences, Deans and Directors, members of Senate, colleagues, academic and non academic staff, University of Benin, and my Lord, spiritual and temporal, gentlemen of the press family members, ladies and gentlemen. I, I want to start with saying that the ways of God are not our ways. At the time I was expecting my professorial appointment to be announced. I had mapped out a plan of presenting, this was in 2003, mapped out a plan that I would present my inaugural lecture three to six months after my, the announcement of my professorship. However, that was not to be until eight years later uh, when the promotion worked very slowly and eventually arrived. And I give God the glory. So, from that point on, the interest in inaugural lecture did not seem to click so much. And I recall, I think 2010 or thereabout, when the registrar sent um, a letter to me saying that um, I was going to lose my, my position if I did not come to present my inaugural lecture. I went to her, that was the former uh, registrar. I went to her, told her, I'm sorry ma'am, I have had a calamity in my family and that had to do with the demise of um, the woman that had to go to be with her Lord in heaven. So, uh, the idea of doing an inaugural lecture had gone. And, uh, but uh, somewhere along the line, friends, uh, professional colleagues, and my children said, and my children said, Daddy, why don't you do this thing? Why not try? I said, I think I'm towards the exit of this place. I don't think I have that kind of interest and it, uh, again. So they, one day about two years ago, I was in church 
My, the pastor said something about, I think the direct statement was, God is not a God of abandoned projects. Hmm. That was a seeker, a motivator. The following Monday I was in the VCO, trying to see whether I could be slotted for the purpose. Unfortunately, I had lost my chances. However, I said, what should I do? They said, go to Vice Chancellor. And Vice Chancellor, I went, like Apostle Paul went to Rome. <laughs> so I, in his magnanimity, he said, OK, you can go on. So a number of debts had been fixed for this business. And um, fortunately, out of the series of less that, uh, dates that uh, did not uh, come through, 27th of September came through, and I was very happy for it. However, this house was full of people, quite unlike what we have today. And we were told, sorry, the federal government, and I think the federal government and ASU, ASU wanted, and did not just ASU, all the labor union decided to vent their spleen on the federal government. And that was why we had to close shop last week Thursday. And I thank God that the thing is happening this Thursday. <laughs> and that is why I said earlier that his ways are not our ways. Thank you, Lord. My journey uh, through higher education has been, when you hear uh, the Oga uh, talk, it looks like it was something that you just take a bike and walk through. It wasn't so. Because after my secondary school, three, one of the three of my uncles that had helped me through secondary, uh, primary and secondary school, one of them called me Lawrence. I'm sorry to tell you that, that we have decided that um, we will not be able to continue because that my mind was, I had already got a form to go to, for the HJC in uh, Hope Water Institute. I said, sorry boy, but I have given you a touch. Use that touch to light your ways. And it is that light that has brought me here today. I have uh, gone through a number of small schools. You leave the, uh, you leave the I, I, I was first appointed as a pivotal teacher, Methodist Boys High School Aron. Then after that place, about um, a year later, I saw myself doing, deviating from my English language and geography to do secretarial studies. And so I was trained for that purpose for two and a half years. I made my 120 in type, a shorthand, 50 words a minute in typewriting. It was not common because if seven or eight, um, um, 12 of us were selected for the program, only four of us made it to that level. So it was at that point that I said, I must follow this direction that God has asked me to follow. And so it was a matter of moving from one devil to the other. In fact, it was only at um, when I left the polytechnic that I spent about three years teaching. Because I was moving every one and a half year or thereabout, I would move from one school to the other. And so in 19, 1990, 1999, oh, no, 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 they're about 1989, my, the government gave me a scholarship. That was not a full, but half scholarship. How I managed the rest is God's, uh, God's doing. <laughs> so I went to the UK, and um, I think uh, God blessed me in every direction in terms of acquiring the level of skill that um, was required by the University of Leeds. With that, I met my way to the University of Manchester, 
and uh, spend two and a half years there because when you get there you want to go home so you cannot afford to waste time as we do here back home so i was there did what i had to do while i was doing that i was also writing when i came back to nigeria in 1983 i did the national service and the following year i was uh, when i left the state school board made me a vice principal six months later i was made a full principal i would have been i mean ordinarily for a young man of 35 years i would have been very happy to sit down there as the principal of school but that was not my destination so i looked at the university of years said, let me go and try my luck there but at that time i had already uh, got admission to got appointment to a number of polytechnics in fact three polytechnics but um i decided to go to you I was to be appointed as assistant lecturer at the University of Uyo, but um, when I, what are your credentials? I presented them to them, and um, I had two papers that were published in British journals. He said, you published this? I said, yes, sir. And um, when the appointment letter came, it was lecturer to business education. So... <laughs> I thank God for that. As if that was not done, I stayed at the University of Uyo and um, I did not have the motivation that I needed because I needed to do my PhD in, in um, the area immediately. So I decided to make, uh, make it, uh, take, uh, take, take a, a step. That step saw me here in the University of Benin in 1991 as a lecturer one, not two. So, uh, was, uh, in the, uh, uh, I was um, a pioneer uh, teacher, lecturer in the Department of Vocational and Technical Education. In fact, there was no department. Initially, when I came, I was placed in the PhD department, and uh, the, the former dean was my head of department. And um, from there, the struggle, we struggled, eventually, a year or two later, a department of um, a full-fledged department of uh, vocational and technical education came about in this university and so we have struggled through um, in terms of student population at that time when I came here I had three students three students but by the fourth year the population had risen to more than hundred and of course um, eventually those who are in vocational and technical education know that we have about the highest number of students in education in this university. No, no, I think I'm done with that. The next. This one. Sorry, yo. Introduction. Well, the subject matter is paradigm transition learning. And I have to try to explain what paradigm is. I looked at the dictionary. Um, the definition of paradigm could not be really, uh, you know, it wasn't clear. But a paradigm is a state of being, a state which one has to move from a stage, one stage to the next stage, you know. And those who have read the work of Kuhn know something about um, a paradigm shift and uh, in this lecture I I use the term paradigm to introduce business education program to my students and um, it was on that point at that level that I thought maybe we could expand the operational ambience of the concept and move forward to add something more for the purpose of this lecture
I don't want to go into those small details. I believe as you read uh, the main text, you'll be able to um, get the main ideas. Um, we have curriculum models. And in fact, all that we study in various subject areas, various disciplines, are based on what is normally referred to as knowledge claim. And so, in education, in education, there are two important philosophers of knowledge, uh, Phoenix and um, Paul Hurst. They have, been they have um, you know, divided knowledge into some, uh, uh, Phoenix said there are uh, six areas of knowledge claim, which I, I think I should put up here. And then Paul Hurst. Paul Hurst own is very simple. He says that there are seven areas of knowledge claim. In other words, you can develop a program, a program using these areas of knowledge to build your curriculum. Those who are in curriculum studies understand what I'm talking about. And he talks about mathematics, human science, physical sciences, literature and fine arts, history, religion, morals and philosophy. However, these authorities' work did not seem to impress me much. They were important, but I thought I needed to move forward to look at um, the works of um, very important authorities, my Vice Chancellor, sir, in the area of science. And these, um, the areas I thought would be important for explaining what paradigm transition knowledge and uh, paradigm transition learning is all about. There are three authorities in the area. Um, Sir Impre Lakatos, 1970, Sir Karl Papa, 1981, and Jürgen Habermas, 1970. And the man that I'm going to, um, you know, seek his support close, very closely is the man called Thomas Kuhn, uh, 1970. And I believe that virtually every academic, though particularly those in the sciences, social sciences, social sciences, know something about Kuhn. Why am I going to them? I want to use their concept to build up what I have called paradigm transition learning. Um, Habermas talked about seven areas of knowledge claim. Talks about uh, knowledge constitutive interest. As each of them specify the areas within which knowledge claim can be met. He has talked about a number, there are three of them. The one that I want to emphasize upon is the, what we call practical interest. A practical interest constitutes that form of knowledge which is evident in human communication or interaction. In strict terms, communicative action is founded on humanistic sciences. That is science of knowledge which has to do with interpretation, explanation, uh, such as done in history, ethics, legal ethnography, and literary studies. Most of these courses which involve self-expression, e.g. Fine, uh, fine and applied arts, are domiciled not only in the arts, but in social sciences, but also in, edu ed sorry, in education. Let me move on to the work of uh, Thomas Kuhn. Um, permit me, sir, to introduce and refresh our memories about Kuhn's propositions. Uh, Kuhn contended that knowledge is not a steady um, and continuous accumulation of facts about objective reality, but a process which evolved, which evolved from the failure of the prevailing state of knowledge to explain the present state of reality by using the usual techniques and formulae. Such a failure in the field of science is normally referred to as um, paradigm, uh, sorry, it's referred to as paradigm transition learning. And so, when we talk about, of course he claims that he explains what he means by scientific revolution. Because it says that when, in, when um, a group, intellectuals, are involved in some analysis of issues or in, engage in some form of research, 
And uh, eventually they realized that um, the former way of explaining things would no longer do in the current way, given the current way of explaining things. They say that there is a move in transition. And he called, he called these anomalies. He's, and he says, when the profession can no longer evade anomalies that subvert the existing tradition, the existing tradition, the tradition of explaining, um, expl explaining things, explaining, um, um, explaining um, issues, statements, policies, and so on. So then begins the extraordinary investigation that leads the profession at last to a new set of com commitment. The extraordinary episode in which that shift occurs is known as scientific revolution. Now, my vice chancellor, my vice chancellor sir, a critical analysis of Kuhn's process of scientific revolution is a reflection of how Students in higher education, as young adults tend to learn, is a historiography on knowledge, to my mind, in 1990, offers a viral framework upon which higher education students may approach learning. For it vividly illustrates the stages of the latter's learning and development. For after all, it is man that makes history, and without man, there can be no history. Ekbayo, 1990. So the process of higher education students, the process which higher education should learn, like that of scientific revolution, will, in this lecture, refer to be referred to as paradigm transition which is a more inclusive concept and sub, sub, uh, substitute to perspective transfor, uh, transformation, uh, transformation as proposed by Jacques Mezirau, 1981. Now, Masterman identifies 21 contextual categories under which Kuhn's uh, use of paradigm might be used. But Kuhn himself mentioned two as exemplary matrix of the scientific community. And of course, an, an exemplar. And the second one exemplar is the one that I, I, we have accepted, I have accepted for this lecture. Now, the second category of meaning that is applied in, in this lecture um, is the one that I refer to essentially as a paradigm transition learning. Now, what does that mean? Paradigm transition learning is a, hypothet a hypothetical construct, a set of assumptions or theories which help to explain the experience of a domain of objective reality. And what do I mean here? Now, hypothetical construct a construct that, we, that is based on some assumptions that we make and some theories that we make. And of course, we try to explain the experience of a particular way of doing things. It is one state of being which one's life, with one's life world. It is the mode of understanding objective reality. What is objective reality? Obje objective, ob objective reality, ob uh, reality which we see, what we see, what we experience, not subjective thinking, but objective thinking, in simple terms. Objective way of doing things are taking a decision. So, how we explain certain uh, phenomena would be determined by our live world. Our live world, the way we see ourselves with the environment, and that life world we can call our paradigm. In the same token, paradigm transition learning implies a state or process which occurs as a result of emergence of as or ascendance of a set of critical awareness which stimulates com or compels our restructuring of our set of beliefs, theories, assumptions, models, 
and values and processes which serve to explain the experiences within each domain of our objective reality. Now, many of us go to church or to some such places. When you get inside a church, a good church for that matter, the way, it, the way think, things are done, prayers are conducted, things are done, or in an organization, you go to see the way the management organizes how human relation matters are being handled. And that, is, that becomes different, far different from what you have seen, where you came from. You now see yourself understanding, understanding, hearing and understanding, and accepting that what is done here is better that, than what I saw somewhere. And so when you change your uh, belief system, because of that kind of uh, uh, what we have observed, you are now moving to another state of reality, objective reality. I have said something about paradigm transition learning, or paradigm transition. And I, the, the, there are some individuals that may not accept paradigm transition. That is, moving from the old ways of doing things, let me put it simply, to new ways of doing things. Now, there are some people that will not want to move. Their belief system has stuck, and they want things to remain that way. They don't change. And of course, um, let me give you an example. In, uh, for instance, the, the 17th century um, marked the age of what we would call in education realism, age of realism. Realism was founded on the practical realities of life, you know, what you can see, what you can make of life, you know. And that age brought in some invention founded on practical realities of life. There were inventions, there were discoveries, you know. And so, the words, uh, the old ways of doing things were rejected, or what they call nominalism, a, f a philosophical theory which rejected universal or general idea as mere words. What you see, what you do, have to be quantified. That was the situation. And of course, the people that were called realists, science realists, such as Copernicus, 1473, 1543, overturned the heliocentric um, theory of um, Ptolemy. Ptolemy was the father of geography. For those of you in that area, I'm sure you know something about Ptolemy. I was taught that in secondary school. Um, so he overturned, that is to say, this first man has said that the earth is flat. And he overturned that, the edge is flat. When you move to once, when you move, maybe when you come here to this place, you find that the edge is, uh, the, 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 uh, um, the earth is flat, and you return back. But Ptolemy said, Copernicus said no. That cannot be. The earth is round, which is what we believe till today. The earth is round. And he calls it rotundity of the earth with its revolutionary movement around the sun. And so, from the period of Ptolemy, from the period of Ptolemy to the new idea brought about by Copernicus, it was people had moved away from the previous ways of thinking to the new ways of thinking about the nature of the earth. So Copernicus' um, discovery, including other facts about the planetary system, were confirmed by the man called Galileo. I'm sure we all know who Galileo was, 1564 to 1642, an Italian scientist, inventor of the telescope. In other words, the revolution of new knowledge, of the new knowledge brought about by Copernicus took 99 years to register as a paradigm 
that is to be accepted university, uh, university, uh, um, universally. However, with the emergence of non-Euclidean geometry and non-Newtonian uh, physics, coupled with the logical impossibility of establishing empirical basis of inductive logic, justification which was used as a basis for accepting or rejecting things suffered a deadly defeat in Prelacatus. Of course, there were individuals that also rejected um, paradigm transition learning. As I hinted earlier, it is not in every situation that individual researchers or learners would accept paradigm transition learning in their research findings or learning for men such as Nuclid, Newton, and Copernicus, their paradigm transitions were only completed when they, through the result of their work, established new ways of learning and objectifying reality. However, it is sad to say that there was this Englishman called um, Joseph Priestley. He was a philosopher, he was a politician, he was a researcher, he was a scientist. And of course, he had discovered something about um, um, that oxygen support combustion. When he made that discovery, other people said, yes, 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 yes. But he said, no, he cannot accept that. And so he stuck with the whole idea of a chemical theory of phlogiston until he's dead. Until he's dead. So individuals can accept new things, and they may refuse to accept new things. That is left to them. Now, let me move to another way of explaining paradigm transition learning. In the, that is in the area of um, developmental psychology. And of course, we know that um, we have had uh, Donald Super, we have had uh, Eli Ginsberg, and um, Harvey Ghost. They have indicated stages of human development, the, the rate of knowledge at one at this stage, at the, when a the person is tied to, the, to zero to uh, two years, two years to twelve years, and so on and so forth. And there are challenges at each level of hum, uh, human development, a stage of human development. If a learner, for instance, cannot effectively achieve success or learn effectively at the level that he is in and is moved to the next level, then his ability to learn further and to achieve objective of his life becomes weak. And that is what um, Eric Erickson said. That's it. To him, there are about uh, there are eight stages of human development. And he said, the fourth and the fifth are very, very important. And if at that time, the individual, a learner, at this time, maybe middle, you know, uh, 18, 20, uh, thereabout, you cannot cope and acquire the level of education that is required of you and do things that are expected of individual at that age, now you are unfit you cannot move further. That is why we, in our society, we see our young persons, oh, he goes to like, a, the case, a, the statement I heard somewhere, he came with three A's, physics, chemistry, mathematics, and so on and so forth. Then, the, the vice chancellor said, well, this is a, a top class, class student, and we are going to use him, you know, effectively. But when it was time for him, to be assigned a kind of work that somebody who had left the secondary school that grade um, should perform, he ran away from the school. Because he had met the requirement, he had not met the requirement of that level of his existence. And so Erickson says, describe life stage in relation to the position uh, the positive learning, the positive learning that takes place when young persons are able to successfully negotiate and to, uh, uh, to negotiate and 
and also to the negative learning that could be resolved when they are not able to do so. That is why paradigm transition learning becomes very important to university students in particular, or students along that range. If they cannot effectively move from one level of learning to the other, and they keep moving, at some point in time, confusion sets in their lives, and there is nothing anybody can do about it. Now, the third um, a theory which could be used to explain a paradigm transition learning is what I have called self-emancipation. Some critics in education have argued that our con conventional system of education has only provided effective, has become effective in producing individuals who can only read and write and think and react along the line of the people in his group. He cannot move to the next paradigm stage. And so, why is that so? Because of the quality of education that has been given to them. Education that is meant for a child to think along the line of the society, along the culture of, the, of, the, of his people, cannot, be, cannot help the child to grow, cannot help the individual to make a transition to the new level of life. And of course, this is what um, Habermas had earlier described. Now, who is one of those I can uh, refer to in the area of um, this emancipation thing? Many of you have read about uh, Paulo Freire, that Brazilian teacher that died a couple of years ago. He was not comfortable with the nature of education in, in Brazil, and so he decided to evolve a new form of education for young persons, for old people, and various categories of people. And of course, he describes edu education, uh, the, the learner as a container, or a, co a co container. And if somebody is a container, where you as a teacher post information on him, then it simply means that he cannot on his own acquire the knowledge that is required of him. And so, the teacher, the student is a depository. The student is a container, and the teacher is a depositor. That form of education cannot help. And that is why he came to discuss, or come about with the concept of, um, um, the concept of um, education that will enable individuals to learn and acquire skills and know the rights and wrongs of the society and be able to help where you can. And he said here, instead of communicating, the teacher issues communiques and make deposits which the student patiently receive, memorize and repeat. Ferry, 1972, verse, um, sir, page 46. And so he called that form of education as a banking system of education. And so what, we, what he required and what he did in Brazil was very, very important. And I think many of those in adult education, non-formal education, uh, that should be their area of concern, uh, particularly those who teach those that have not had the opportunity to go to maybe say primary, secondary, normal primary, uh, secondary school. And he's decided to write a book called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And when you read that book, you know that there is really a pedagogy of the oppressed. That is a form of instruction that will be useful for people, you know, whether you are in school or any other organization, that you can learn and acquire skills, whether there is somebody teaching you or you teaching yourself. So what it required, therefore, what is required of us is a um, problem-solving type of education. Freire's position um, is that individuals must discover themselves. That is what I'm talking about. Students, the category of students I'm talking about here are those from 17 up. 
because it is at that level that a student is expected in a university, not the underage in a university. So, he said, the student must discover themselves as lacking our objective, objective knowledge through reflection. How many of us can actually do re reflect upon issues? Maybe an assignment has been given in the class, problem solving. Many say this thing is too much. Maybe you'll find a few that can reflect on the subject matter and come up, come up with an um, appropriate uh, solution. As a learner, we must have a true perception of what we, are, we lack and how to acquire it. And for the student, we must involve them. We must involve them in dialectical thought. <coughs> that is through action and reflection, which is what Paul Freire called praxis. And therefore achieve an objective type of learning that will lead to their liberation and that of their fellow men. Because when you learn, when you acquire knowledge and skill in an area, your knowledge will be beneficial not only to you, but to those around you. There are, I have produced four levels, not really, uh, you know, there's not been a, a research about it. But from my observation, I consider that there are four categories of paradigm transition learning state. An extraordinary paradigm transition learning state, outstanding paradigm transition learning state, extant paradigm transition learning state, and poor or negative paradigm transition learning state. The extraordinary group that we are talking about, like um, Einstein, and, um, Einstein and the rest of them, and of course, in Nigeria, maybe we can talk about Wolesho Inka, Chino Achebe, and the rest of them. Beni Wangu. Incidentally, all these, are, all these great men are dead, except um, uh, the guru, uh, the, 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 uh, man, the man in Lagos. So, outstanding paradigm transition. I can say that there are many lecturers that can be referred to as paradigm as meeting or arrange or because it could be described or be put in the state of outstanding paradigm transition state because they have done great things you know in the sciences i've heard some of the discoveries that have been made those are changes you know and i've seen them in television you know and the minister of education trying to um, expose what they are doing they are those that have produced papers great papers that uh, could be found only in um, uh, first class international, first rate international journals, you know, impact journals and index journals. I think a few of us have done so, have published there. And um, I think a good number of lecturers in the university can be said to be within the outstanding paradigm state. I don't know whether I'm wrong there. Then those, the third category, extant paradigm transition state. And of course, these are general people. They are there in the system. They can work with the student. They can give them, they can learn, or they can give knowledge. But then, the impact of what they teach are not very strongly felt by the students. But they are in the system. And then the poor or negative paradigm group those are the ones that move with the system, you know, the less, less affair teachers plus less affair students, nothing good comes out of there. That's their form of learning or knowledge. Now, I'm talk, I have to talk about makers of reality now. One expression which takes a central stage in paradigm transition learning is makers of reality. A teacher that can make an ignorant student, I'm sorry, child in the primary school to move from not knowing to add and, uh, add and subtract, to be able to do so and to multiply and to divide and then be able to enable the student to know, to explain why it has to be, the answers have to be what they are, could be said to be a maker of reality. Because they, they are, some people are the people that make something happen. Some of our students here, I can say, I can call them makers of reality. 
our lecturers, our teachers in various institutions, when you see them in action, academic situation, you can regard them as makers of reality because they make something happen. The solution to a problem that could not be solved, they are able to solve them. In that case, we call them makers of reality. How can we turn our education student, our tertiary education student to make us a reality? That can only come about through some uh, uh, pedagogical, uh, pedagogical models. And the model, the, even though there are several models of teaching and learning, I think the one that has got my fancy is experiential learning. Experiential learning has a very long history which uh, it is not my place to go there. Um, it is a learning process which could be used to explain, a student could use to explain, okay, experiential learning strategies for producing makers of reality. Let me say, sir, my vice chancellor, sir, how one may adopt experiential learning strategies to effect paradigm transition process that may in turn produce makers of reality in our students. I have created, I have indicated here that the first stage involved would involve individual acceptance and um, understanding and accepting of what education, of what um, experiential learning is all about. Maybe I should put it in the way um, Kolb and Ruben, or Kolb and McIntyre have put it. He has a cycle. The cycle is there, I'm sure everybody's in it. The first, what, let, let me explain everything by word of that cycle. We have one, two, three, four. The first stage of learning, of acquiring experience, is what we call concrete experience, concrete stage. We try to look at what is being given to us. Wow, this is, uh, okay. And there are those who want to learn only what they see. They learn better when they see uh, something in concrete terms. And then the second stage uh, has to do with object, object, uh, reflective um, observation. Those who know the work of Osborne, in terms of trying to um, reflect idea generation stage. In idea generation stage, where we have reflective observation, students in class are asked to, for instance, what, does, what can a spoon be used for, or a fork be used for? Some student could say, you know, for eating. The other one would say, for hitting somebody, and so on and so forth. And then you put the student through, and many, all of them will give, or most of them will give ideas, what they see as the rule of the rule of a spoon. It would be surprising to find that by the time the exercise is done, and the students are now asked to pick the best of the, of the answers, we'll find that what a spoon can do can be far more than eating, using to eat. Then it is from reflective observation that we move on to abstract conceptualization. So the fact that uh, the concept that we have derived from reflective observation, we do some abstraction about it and make some concluding, uh, concluding, and, uh, conclu concluding statement and learn from the experiment or from the process. The final stage is active experimentation. At this stage, what we have come up with from concrete experience to reflective observation to abstract conceptualization is for us to try and bring about a solution. And that stage is a stage of solution making. And if it happens that um, the result is not favorable, we go back. It's, it's cyclical. We go back. Uh, from concrete experience uh, until we get to the solution. 
at the stage of um, active experimentation. And so that is uh, one major approach which we normally use to ensure that students uh, acquire skills, you know, that might lead them to become makers of reality. Then another point that is very important is for us to talk about uh, collaborative learning. Collaborative learning is very important in experiential learning. For instance, joint goal setting by both the teacher and the students or reflection of existing goals, joint identification of important problem questions, problems or questions, identification of and utilization of available resources, of of sources of information for problem identification, collaborative effort between teacher and the students in the latter's performance in relation to set objective. It is not very common for teachers. When you come to talk about this kind of learning, in a normal classroom situation or the Nigerian classroom situation of 50 plus students, can this happen? In a university class where three quarters of the students are hung on t the chairs and stools and siding the wall, can this be done? One teacher and 80 students with no seats. It becomes difficult. That is why paradigm transition learning is a very critical form of learning and which has to be done in a very, very important, a very serious way. Um, the teaching of based on experiential learning can always be very difficult. And I have um, put down some examples here. And you can see Awambo 1979. Uh, in Awambo, 1979, all these things have been put there. Now, let me start with lecture. The lecture method, for those in education, we see it as a very bad method of teaching, isn't it? But then, that is because we do not understand the nitty-gritty of lecture method of teaching. And so, when you apply experiential method of teaching, it is possible that... Um, you can get the result that you get from any other form of uh, instructional method. And so I have indicated here, the first is analytical question. You may ask analytical question, synthesizing questions, and of course, and of course, use of alternative situations. All these are explained in here. So with these, the lecture could, be very, could become very, very interesting. Another point about teaching, uh, teaching um, using experiential method to teach a lecture subject is that at the point which you are uh, talking and explaining to the students, one or two students may have an idea that has come from that lecture and it clicks with the idea that is in his cognitive structure and he picks it and thinks about it and makes a greater sense of what was in the cognitive structure and what he has been taught at the moment. But unfortunately too, at that point, what the teacher is saying is lost to him. We have also discussion group method, which uh, some people think that uh, it is a just <laughs> discussion, group discussion. It is not like that. I have outlined some of the key approaches that um, this method of instruction could be made uh, very useful based on experiential method. There have been case studies, case studies very, very important in the sciences and in social sciences, particularly because of their belief in empiric empiricism. They consider that, well, if what is given to the student is not quantified, uh, it's not quantitative, it cannot work as a learning process. Uh, for those in, uh, you know, they try to use uh, various methods to uh, methods that um, may not be adequate. But the least I have given here, the, the least on um, how case studies could be made um, have been proven by uh, s uh, several authorities. Role play is another one. It looks very simple, but it is not so. And I have also indicated how it could be done. Now, talking about contributions, I have made a number of research um, work, a case study of Nigerian technical school, 
uh, the study was intended to use um, meeting, you know, and uh, we used um, uh, we use um, a method. Uh, we use a method that uh, would make us understand or make the, the individual to learn more effectively. The purpose of the research was to use the survey feedback, of which training and retraining intervention were adopted in the school in Akwaibom State. The result of both the statistical and graphic, um, graphic analysis of the uh, effectiveness of the intervention showed conclusively that participants' meeting skills increased appreciably. And of course, the, going by the, 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 the approach that was used, this, the, 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 second approach, the second method, or the repeated method, get better result than the first approach of um, instruction. Then we have organizational interdependence, Nigerian technical school. The purpose of the research was to use survey feedback again, of which training and retraining interventions were adopted. 50 of the 60 students in Akwaibom State took part and were selected for the study. The findings are many, but um, I want to say that um, when the structure of management, when the structure of management and system of control in each unit of a school is um, highly formalized, interdependent becomes very difficult. When design of a school organization is based on departmentalization, it tends to encourage differentiation. These group says we are on our own. This uh, section says we are on our own. The other one says we are on our own. Integration becomes very difficult. That is why this study became very, very important. Then there was this other study on Nigerian executive perception of the work, of, uh, uh, comp work competencies of secretarial administration graduates. The study was conducted to establish how effective in public, how effective public and private sector organization executive uh, perceive the cognitive and affective psychomotor competencies of NCE and HND Office Technology and Management Student, OTM. Analysis of the results showed that public and private executive did not differ significantly in their perception of the role of NCE or the knowledge level of NCE and the HND students. The two groups of OTM graduates were not different in their perception. In fact, they were not different in their perception of their role in the organization. The other study had to do with um, comparison of recall performance of typewriting, keyboarding, and non-typewriting students. Now, in a normal situation, it is found that uh, normally it is considered that when you are typing a document, when you are typing a document, you don't know what you are typing, you are just typing. But unfortunately, from this, this study, it became very, very clear, though this study had been conducted as far back of um, 1876 uh, by Ebingos. So what I was doing was just um, a repeat, a collaborative uh, to see how the study could go turn. And it turned out that um, there was no difference between students that typed in terms of their knowledge of the subject that they typed. Now, the issue was, you type this paper and you read this paper. Now, those who read the paper, English language students, and students of some other uh, subject across the faculty of education. They were given this uh, sub subject to study and to read. The other one was to, the, other, the first group was to type. The second and third group was to read. And then after that, each group was asked to write down what you have remembered about this, what you studied. And of course, there was no significant difference in their results. That explains that um, if you call your secretary to the office and say, because the examination is coming up, and um, sit down here in my office and type, if she has a good, effective recall 
effort. It can reproduce about 70% of what it have. And if it's a bad one, it can give it to the students. And you start asking, where did the result? Where, who did this? Who did this? You know. So that is um, a very important lesson that we learned from that study. Then the fourth one had to do with collaborative assessment in higher education on opinion survey of Nigerian university lecturers and students. Um, this study was conducted in 2006 by Ekmeyo and Ogona. The purpose was to investigate whether collaborative assessment cars would be a more acceptable approach by higher education students and teachers for, examin for examining and assessing student performance as compared to the conventional teacher control approach. In a number of, in a number of um, cases, it was discovered that um, the Nigerian higher education staff and students did not significantly differ with regards to the ranking of the various methods of CARS. The subjects were also agreed that the reasons that agreed on the reason generally are due for the low interest of um, learners in collaborative assessment. Collaborative assessment has to do with um, a situation where students and teachers um, assess the performance of students so that each one will give its result. The student will give the result of what he has done. Now when it is in group, the group in student, uh, group, group A, group B, group C, and of course the teachers, they will assess, a group will assess another group or assess individual student. And it is found that in a number of cases, what the, the, the performance of the students do not differ, you know, from those of the teacher. But in some cases too, you have um, a situation where a teacher gives 50, the student gives himself 70. Mm -hmm. um, the pres the, uh, I have, um, in my other works, I have produced a good number of students as was mentioned earlier, in business education, from three students in business education to far more than 150. And then in 1999 to 2000, I introduced the master's program in business education, which attracted a good number of students. And then 2014-15, we were able to um, bring in the PhD program, which uh, was very, because the argument from the authorities was that, where are the people that are going to teach? You cannot teach it alone, but by the grace of God, we, we got approval. And I can, uh, I can say that today, the, third, uh, the, three, uh, the three sets have come out. Um, the, first, the first person in the first set did a study on the, um, paradigm, no, 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 on experiential learning, and is going to the faculty for um, faculty assessment of his PhD work. And others are in the lineup, and I think that, um, I don't know, it's just that um, today is not, like, this Thursday is not like la that last Thursday. So all those that were here, you know, could not be here today. And so um, I could still say, those teachers that are in business education that have been my students, please, would you like to stand up? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so um, please sit. Those, uh, there are 10 of them, about 15 of them in the doctoral program, and they are at various stages of completion. And I thought that I needed to do this I needed to do this so that um, at least it would be on record that um, we are not doing anything that is not uh, important in business education. And business education is a, an area, an area that is being very, very attractive. The government wants it, organized individuals, uh, universities want it. And I now know that um, it is a program that is different from business education 
of 1980s and so on. And um, I think um, the VC representative may wish, this is uh, out of the ordinary, to beg that business education is no longer put together in the department called vocational and technical education. What is happening that at the University of Nigeria and Suka, you have a faculty of vocational and technical education with business education, technical education, home economics, and the computer education as departments. The University of Uyo, the same thing has happened. The University of um, Amadou Bello University, it has happened partially because technical and business are still together. And, um, but as for the private universities, they have separate department for business education. And I hope with that kind of arrangement, business education and indeed all the vocational areas of education, all the vocational uh, sub-disciplines in education will prosper in this university more than other universities. Acknowledgement. Sorry, um, I have done a lot in the area. Anyway, when the VC was reading, you had heard um, my contribution to education in various um, areas of endeavor, um, in our, the educational organizations, and of course, the NUC, the NCCE. And I can tell this uh, uh, um, audience that because of NCCE, NBTE and NUC assignment, I have been to universities, colleges of education, all the colleges of education except KB. I don't know whether that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, all these are, I owe the glory to God because it's been quite an effort to go and do this. Recently, even with my bad leg, I was in. Um, Nasrawa in the new Federal University of University, Federal University in Nasarawa and the Nasarawa State. And of course, if I had not gone there, business education would have gone. But when I got there, I told them the very true nature of business education. I don't want to tell you whether I did approve that the NUC should accept it or not um, for as a program. But I thought they needed to do something more uh, for that program to be accredited. Um, let me talk about um, acknowledgement. Let me acknowledge the glory and the majesty of the God that has been my stronghold from cradle. The God who could have made me, uh, who could have made me um, to be what I am today accept him and to him be the honor and adoration from generation to generation i want to appreciate my vice chancellor professor ffo ruense who has continued to make important strides toward the development of this university particularly in the area of human resource development i once again sincerely thank him for granting me the opportunity to do this inaugural lecture, which he has encouraged seriously in this university. Have you have heard the number of inaugural, inaugural that have been conducted here since he came here as a vice chancellor? I don't know whether there is a need record that can beat that in the university. <laughs> I must earnestly appreciate my former head of department Dean and Vice Chancellor Professor Ojo Shudi for his amazing human relations stance and policy that made the university to become a center of peace and harmony as soon as he assumed office as the Vice Chancellor. I must also acknowledge him in relation to his staff recruitment effort that benefited a good number of staff in this university, of course including myself. I must acknowledge most of my, uh, my professional associations, such as Nigeria Academy of Education, Association for Promoting Quality Education in Nigeria, Association of Business Educators of Nigeria, for the opportunity to serve 
my profession, business education. My professional association must be highly appreciated for during my presidency. I had the opportunity and pri privilege in of serving the association and the nation in a number of capacities, e.g. as member of the Reference Committee on Science and Technical Education, through which I was privileged to present three successful memos on business education to the federal government. My warm appreciation goes to my late professor of philosophy of education, of technical and vocational education, University of Leeds, Reverend, Reverend Professor Tenny Wesson, who introduced me to different aspects of philosophy of technical and vocational education, including the philosophy of knowledge. I most deeply appreciate my PhD lecturers namely Lev Professor Yenta and Yema Tola of the Faculty of Education, and from the Department of Business Administration, Professor Akerele, Lev Professor Akerele, and Professor Nebunebo, retired, who exposed me to their respective areas of business management most expertly and professionally. So when you see me discuss business education, it is not one-sided business education I'm talking about but the one that has to do with the fact that I have gone there. I have seen those who are in it, and they have coached me, and I appreciate them. Um, to be highly appreciated is a former colleague who incidentally cannot be here because of some incident that had taken place in his, had taken place in his home. Uh, Professor Raymond Wamaye, who we toil together to ensure that vocational and technical education rose to enviable height in this university. Um, a few th I, I regret at every point that he is not in this university because technical education has not been able to reach the height I expected it would since he left this place. But I thank God for those that are there. I know they will grow from level to level and glory to glory in technical education and make us proud or prouder about technical education than the way it is today. My warm appreciation and love must go to Let M. Oanyaruba, Let Professor T. U. Tobi, Professor Mrs. Salami, Professor Mrs. Ukovyomo, Professor Wameye for their toils and challenges to make vocational and technical education become what it is today. My appreciation must also be extended to the present acting head of the Department of Vocational and Technical Education, Mrs. Ulumise, for being able to keep the department going in spite of some challenges. <laughs> My appreciation also goes to all the other members of the Department of Vocational and Technical Education, UNIBEN, whose contributions have greatly kept the department moving forward. Those I can remember include Professor Ibnedio. Incidentally, Ibnedio was my student. <laughs> Dr. Mrs. Maba, Dr. Dr. Iyamu, Wembrige, Wadiani, Ebri, Osui, Obusawa, um, Ojaga, Apart from Chukwedo, all these were my master students. And they are lecturers in BTE department. Appreciating the Dean of Education and his deputy, Dr. Rousseau, is very deserving in view of their enormous contribution, peace and harmony in the Faculty of Education. My appreciation must also go to my fellow professors, past and present, and friends in the Faculty of Education, as they remain examples to others in the faculty. They include Professor Emeritus and Professor and um, N. A. That is Professor Emeritus N. A. Mwago, Professor Dr. Mrs. Awambo, Professor and Dr. Mrs. Awambo, Professor and Dr. Mrs. J. 
Ademi, Professor Ayo Wye, Professor C. N. Moifo, Ofebu, Ojogu, Olubo, Alutu, Musa, and others so dear to my heart, but space will not allow me to mention them. <laughs> to all the gospel, gospel ministers in the Faculty of Education, Reverend Mon Madiani, Reverend Atta, and all the other lecturer ministers in the faculty and the university as a whole, I say thank you. May God continue to bless you. I must sincerely appreciate my papa in the Lord. My papa and mama in the Lord, Reverend Dr. Felix Mobude, who have been the spiritual mentors of my family since we came to Benin City more than two decades ago. <laughs> Bishop Nick and Reverend Mrs. Nick Ihanacho have arised ministry to you and remembered for their prayers and love for my family. Worthy of remembrance are the classmates. My classmates at the University of Leeds and Manchester, UK, namely Eko Akman, born in Echi, who are now chiefs or Nze in their respective communities. <laughs> <laughs> Elders Okun Basi and Usama Bosowo and other families for the hospitality. Uh, I have usually received from them, particularly the, uh, particularly the rem 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 reminiscences of God. Um, re reminiscences of, of um, uh, what we remembered about Ma University of Manchester, and we used to call ourselves Mancunians. I must appreciate my young village head. Barista Ipong, who for the love of the community left his lucrative legal career to serve his people. I must equally appreciate one of my kinsmen, if we sit now, all of them would have been here, but for one reason or the other, they couldn't come at a short notice again. A former principal of a school, Mr. David Oba, who spearheaded financial support from the community for me at the time I was embarking on the UK pilgrimage. It is important at this point to appreciate my relations. Mary Epeyong, 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 Umor, Itam, Eyo. One of them or two of them were to be here, but because of the short notice, uh, they are unable to be here. And Gloria, Madam Gloria Epeyong, that one was my student at the University of Uyo. It is a joy indeed to appreciate my three-year-old amiable wife for coming to rekindle the sunshine in my life. <laughs> Pastor Mrs. Shelley Equion. I wish to appreciate all my children, namely Mrs. Edidion, Udwabong Osahon, who are staff of this university, 18 years now. And Christabel, I'm sure Christabel knows everybody in the sciences seem to know Christabel. He's doing his national service um, in Undo now. He was in, this, in, the, um, in the medical sciences, basic medical science faculty. My final appreciation goes to my late wife, Imo Lawrence Epeyong, who while in this climb lived to, be, to, to the building of a loving, faithful wife, and a mother may her soul continue to find favor in the bosom of her of him who called her back home to greater glory. In conclusion, the lecture adopted a eclectic approach to draw from the developmental stages, uh, from the developmental stages of business education as introduction to anchor. <coughs> major thesis of the lecture, Paradigm Transition Learning, which its main source of explanation were drawn from the works of principal authorities and philosophy of knowledge and uh, invention in business education, Jürgen Habermas and Prelakatos, Thomas Kuhn, Christopher Latham Scholes in business education, 
on the basis of all the inferences drawn to clarify what this lecture has been able to clarify, the conclusion to, the, to be drawn in this lecture is that a number of key disciplines are capable of providing the criteria for the conclusion for the for lecturers in the conclusion in the area of knowledge and the mode of teaching the mode of teaching in business education there is a little mix up there <coughs> and so it had also shown the rationale by which business education could be taught or business education or any other subject could be taught to make the learner higher education student to become uh, to create amongst the higher education students makers of reality a number of recommendations have been made here experiential learning uh, with collaborative assessment units should be established in Nigerian tertiary institutions so that teachers or lecturers may acquire the kind of skill abilities that are required for them of them to produce the kind of students that are the lecture is talking about there should be regular in-service training of, an, of instructional techniques on collaborative assessment including those on experiential learning for lectures for lecturers for lecturers in order for them to be effective in their teaching efforts lecturers should be exposed to instruction on collaborative assessment in order for them to be able to adopt a collaborative method in examining and assessing their student performance. I don't know. I am a maker of reality. I don't know whether you are a maker of reality. Are you a maker of reality? Yes. Thank you very much.
thank you very much the vice chancellor and the noble lecturer wants us to thank each and every one of us for coming around to be a part of today's noble lecture venerable professor mon wandiani we want to appreciate you seriously for coming uh, honestly uh, next week thursday we shall be having another inaugural lecture and uh, professor ac ugu is has been so active the wife will be delivering the next inaugural lecture and uh, we want to recommend you next week will be your turn all our distinguished professors seated in the hall we want to appreciate you all we thank god that you are all here professor and uh, Mrs. Eregio, we also thank you for coming around. May God bless you. Professor Abuku, we recognize you, sir. Thank you very much for being here. The inaugural lecturer is inviting each and every one of us to a wonderful reception at the UBTH golf course. The UBTH golf course. You know, for our students, you know you are writing exams. And uh, for that particular reason, we want you to be well refreshed. Your refreshment will also be at the UBTH golf course. May you please rise. Second stanza of the national anthem will be what we'll take after the Uniben anthem. Please remain where you are. Standing, the vice chancellor leads the procession out of the auditorium.